So who are we? Um, I'm part of United Health Group. United Health Group uh, is the biggest or second biggest, depending on how you count it, uh, health services company in the country. Uh, we have a market cap of 56 billion. We're number 22 on the Fortune 500 list. So we're big, we're very big. Um, recently, we divided into two main companies, United Health Care, which is the benefits arm of what we do, and Optum, which is services. And within Cert Optum, there are three divisions. Uh, Optum Insight, which does everything from clinical trials, publishing, uh, data analysis, uh, pharma oversight, to OptumRx, which is our pharmacy and specialty pharmacy and pharmaceutical support arm, and Optum Health, which interfaces with about 300,000 people a day uh, through nurses, physicians, online, texting, uh, you name it, we're trying it. Um, my particular division is the more innovative arm, and I oversee uh, complex conditions, which include transplant, uh, infertility, maternity, and a variety of other areas. And um, I, I've worked in the transplant area off and on for about 10 years. So um, that'll, that kind of clouds my, my biases here. Transplants are going up. Um, I heard Mr. Boo's discussion earlier uh, from NMDP, and I'm gonna skip all my NMDP slides. Uh, I should disclose up front that we have a very good relationship with the NMDP. We consider them a partner. We also have a very good relationship with a family bank, which is Cord Blood Registry. And I'll explain that relationship shortly. Um, I think it's a really exciting time in transplant. I don't know if you know, but uh, we're doing new and very creative combinations, uh, new diagnoses areas, diagnostic areas. Just in Chicago alone, uh, take Northwestern as an example. Uh, we now have uh, about a dozen patients who've been given stem cells plus a kidney transplant who aren't on any immunosuppressants at all. I think that's pretty incredible. Uh, and actually, of all their patients, they've had only one failure. So that may be a new area for us. Uh, Dr. Richard Burt at Northwestern, doing a lot of work on autoimmune. We all thought he was crazy 10 years ago, completely bonkers. We don't think that today. We think that uh, there's a place for it, we just don't know what it is yet. So. I think there's plenty of opportunity. Um, as you see, unrelated donor transplants are going up, and we anticipate they're gonna continue to go up. Uh, why do a transplant? I think you all know this. Cancer, uh, immunological issue, um, you know, hematologic, inborn errors of metabolism, the usual. I liked Karen Ballin's discussion this morning because I think she did bring up the two key areas that we have to solve with uh, cord blood transplants, which is um, engraftment and immune recovery. And uh, it, it's just so critical because cord blood is going up even though the NMDP says it's leveling off. We're seeing it going up and it's costlier uh, for us as an insurance company. So we want to see more research in engraftment and immune recovery so that we don't have patients in the hospital for over a month. Kudos to NMDP. Uh, he talked a little bit about the HRSA initiative. And I see NMDP and CIBMTR as the next UNOS, if you know the um, UNOS is for solid organ transplant. This is the initiative for stem cell transplant. Indications, most insurance companies today have a 
most if not all, have a standard list. And all these things are on there. What's not on there? So let me tell you what we do. Each year, we convene a panel of experts. We comb through every piece of literature in the English language we can to determine what we're going to cover and what we're not. And then it all goes into our transplant guidelines. Um, and providers can get a copy of our transplant guidelines. Uh, now, with our guidelines, um, I just look back at 2006 as an example versus 2012 to see what had changed. So in 2006, uh, we were pretty hesitant about covering cord blood for, for anyone. Uh, we allowed it for children, uh, but it took extra scrutiny for adults even at that time. Today, um, a single unit for children is standard of care. Uh, we still have our guidelines saying matched related is first, before you go to NMDP second, cord blood third, um, but we are indicating that any pediatric patient under a COG protocol, children's oncology group, standard of care. So if they're using a cord blood unit, standard of care. Um, and we don't go much further than that. I was amazed at how many new indications we've gotten year over year over year. And I'd like to read to you some of them just from 2011 to 2012. Uh, for leukemia, pro-lymphocytic leukemia, in the myelodysplastic area, myelofibrosis, in the hematologic area, Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome, in the immunodeficiency area, Gaucher's type 1, uh, if they have failed enzyme treatment or if they have pain that's not healed with enzyme treatment. Uh, inherited metabolic disorders such as epidermal lysis bullosa. Uh, one of my favorites, MINGI, mitochondrial neurogastrointestinal encephalopathy. I think we get three cases of those a year. Um, lymphocytic Im immunodeficiencies such as DeGeorge's, calcium channel deficiency, phagocytic deficiencies such as Chidiak Higashi syndrome, and I'm sure I'm uh, really messing up that name, and then many, many others. I think we added uh, about 50 new cord blood indications this past year. Um, so I think the research is getting there, uh, and I'm going to go through a little bit of how we look at the research uh, in just a minute. Um, but first, let me talk about cord blood banking and how we view that. So in our maternity arm of our company, we're overseeing over a quarter of a million uh, deliveries a year, quite a few deliveries. With that, we are encouraging uh, donation to NMDP, uh, especially of uh, certain ethnic groups. Uh, we think it's part of our responsibility to promote the whole field, and uh, especially with N N NMDP. And then uh, secondly, with our partner in family banking, Cord Blood Registry, uh, we do have a directed donation program so that any family member who has um, someone in the family with a transplantable disease uh, CBR will um, process cells and store those cells for free. And we think this is a, a very nice service that they're providing to us. To date, uh, just this year alone, um, there have been um, 26 transplants as a result of this directed donation program with um, six uh, to children with ALL five lymphomas, and four sickle cells. So that uh, arm is a you know, nice collaboration and, and has been working well. Then finally, uh, on the optum side of the house, um, we are encouraging people to think about cord blood um, 
private banking. Um, even though there is a fairly remote chance that the units will be needed, we still think that uh, people are reading about it, they're asking us about it, um, they want to know what they can do. And I have to say I'm fairly biased in this area. Um, I went through, my husband and I went through five years of infertility treatment, had a horrible time conceiving. At the time where we finally did deliver, by the way, twins, wouldn't recommend it. Um, but at that time, uh, we would have paid 10 grand, 15 grand, my husband's a physician too. Uh, we would have paid a lot of money to do family banking. And we live in Chicago, and at that time, 14 years ago, it just was not available. We could have gone downtown an hour away, but in um, all the suburbs, including my, my 800 bed hospital, it was just not available. And uh, if you're thinking about new areas to address, to find more participants uh, for um, private banking, I would recommend thinking about the infertility group. Um, more and more people are um, becoming infertile because we're waiting to have our families, especially now during the recession. And if you've worked so hard to have a baby, you want to do everything possible to make sure that every safeguard is there for the future. Um, plus, a lot of us just really support research. So that's our relationship and our feelings about uh, cord blood banking. Now, how do we get to standard of care from experimental? Um, and when do we pay for things that are experimental? Well, United Health Group pays for experimental, investigational, and unproven treatment every day. We always pay for it on a clinical trial. It has to be a well-designed clinical trial, and the patient has to be in a life-threatening situation, not expected to live uh, a year, basically. So we um, sometimes pay for phase one trials, but very frequently pay for phase three. And phase two is in the middle there. Uh, almost all of our benefit plans allow coverage for something experimental if it's a patient uh, in a life-threatening situation and almost all, I mean, when we're talking about cord blood and stem cells, uh, that patient is in a life-threatening situation. What we look for when we're adding new indications, is it a randomized clinical controlled trial? Um, are there cohort studies available? Is it uh, multi-site as opposed to single site? Uh, has the FDA or CMS said this is a good thing to do? We approve it. Uh, what about the medical societies out there? We're always looking for societies to show um, that they agree this indication, this transplant, this use of stem cells is appropriate. Uh, I will tell you that we've pushed medical societies to make decisions. Um, we're, we work actively when we feel that they're not moving fast enough, which is a lot of the time. Uh, we will push them uh, and try to lobby for them to think about going a little faster in the right direction. And then we go through a lot of review. Uh, we bring in uh, experts in whatever field we're looking at, and usually experts in the area in question. Uh, so we would not think of adding pediatric cord blood transplant indications without having a pediatric cord blood transplanter who does active research in that area. Um, we have several levels of internal review. We have two bodies who are completely separate from my group who will review any uh, additional indications. And uh, even after that, it goes through several committees. So it's a big process. With all that, though, I can tell you, Every year we're adding more indications. And I think that's 
great way to go. Uh, we pay great attention to the grade system, which is, as you know, used nationally and internationally. Uh, we like the well-done, randomized, controlled trials. We accept 1B and 1C. When you're getting down below 2A, it's tough. And then we tap into the expert opinion. Because some of these things are so rare, there's never going to be a clinical trial. You just have to take a leap of faith. So recommendations. Each insurer has their list of transplant guidelines. Uh, try to figure out what that is. Um, I would say we are one of the most progressive. And I'd also say that many other insurance companies just copy us, which is fine with us. Look at the CMS list. Know the um, state mandates. Know what Medicaid covers. Um, but know the state mandates for commercial, too, because in certain states, many clinical trials are covered that you wouldn't think would be covered. From a research perspective, we're, we're looking for those proven superior outcomes. But we know that there's a, a lack of data in areas where we have very few patients. And um, we will use those expert opinions for that uh, indication. As to regenerative medicine, very, very exciting. Uh, in one of my offices in Chicago, I sit next to the, the behavioral group. Bunch of psychiatrists. It's very interesting. They have their own little quiet room, and yeah, yeah they're they're funny. Um, but I mentioned, you know, there's starting to be some research on autism using stem cells, cord blood for autism. They went berserk because they're looking for that holy grail. And I said, calm down. We're just starting. It's got a long ways to go. Um, partnerships are really important. Do we pay the private bank directly for the stem cells we need for our patients? No, we don't. Um, the, we pay only the transplant centers. Aetna, Cigna, the Blues, they pay the transplant centers. Uh, so our negotiations are strictly with the transplant center. Uh, and w we pay more for cord blood, I can tell you that much. Um, but it, it's an ongoing, almost yearly negotiation with them um, to provide that total service for us. That being said, I think our relationship with CBR has been extremely positive. Um, we could also tell you that of the patients, the families that have donated um, without having an indication in the family, uh, many of those have turned up to need a transplant down the line as well. So I think uh, relationships are important. Knowing mandates are important. Knowing guidelines is important. And without that full look, um, you won't be as, as successful. With that, I'll take any questions. I'm sure we have a bunch of questions. Let's start out. How much does it cost? Yeah. No. <laughs> I thought that the role of an insurance company was to reimburse a medical procedure after a doctor has authorized it. So I'm puzzled by your saying that we encourage patients to think about private cord blood banking. You know, at, at what point are you having that contact with the patient and encouraging them? to think about private cord blood banking, what tools are you using to encourage them? So encourage, I would not say, and maybe I misspoke, it's more like educate. So first of all, we manage many, many infertility patients, and we manage many, many uh, maternity patients. And by manage, I mean we are trying to work with the patient to get to the best provider for the right care at the right time. We want that patient to have best possible outcomes. Um, United Healthcare is insurance. We are not. And that's why there's a firewall between us. We are health services. Part of our health services is trying to figure out what people are interested in, 
what they're looking for, what their questions are, uh, what other things they want, and seeing if we can get the best possible education to them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, I might as well push the envelope. I mean, we've got a room full of poor blood bankers from multiple banks, and I get the impression that you're sending all your patients to CBR, and I'm surprised you have to glitch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have a fire hose up here if you guys try to rush the stage, it's all covered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our, our brochure uh, does not mention names. So our free program for, for families, uh, we do have a separate education on that, and that does mention CBR, but that's because they're providing that service to us for free. So yeah, is it too cozy of a relationship? Ah, I don't know. Well, are you open to extending that relationship to the other banks in this in this room or yeah, in the field? Yeah, quite possibly. Yes. I mean, CBR is offering to store tissue for free. Um, if other banks would offer to store that tissue, perhaps. Oh, we'd definitely talk to you. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let me let me ask a kind of follow-on question. Do you envision a time in the future when either United Healthcare or some other, the industry as a whole, begins to fund storage of cord blood banks in private banks? Because there's a significant cost savings. I know the utilization rate for private banks is extraordinarily low, but if a, a unit of tissue comes out of a private bank for one of your customers, or United Healthcare's customers, you're saving the $35,000 cost. Uh, by the unit and so do you envision a time when that might happen and what would it take to get there? I'm sure a lot of people here would be very happy to find out that they their patients could get reimbursed for the cost of storing the tissue. Um, I would say the place that that's going to happen first mm -hmm. is our very largest employer groups yeah. who are a lot more progressive than United Healthcare fully insured. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and we're already talking to them uh, about what they want how they want it, they do pay extra. Yes, they, they do. They realize that families like this. Well, I know that's true in California, particularly in Northern California, some of the much larger high-tech companies, uh, one of which in particular I know well, is, uh, yeah, is open to that possibility. Yeah. So, so I, what about, what about the industry as a whole? Big. So if, if the large employers begin to lead the charge there, do you think the industry, the insurance industry would follow suit? Um, I think the insurance aspect of the industry is looking at total costs. Mm -hmm. So if we can figure out a model that saves us money mm -hmm. and knowing that, um, you know, getting the actuaries working on it, mm -hmm. if we come out at the end saving money, yeah, I think it could happen. Okay. All Definitely. right. Yes. I'm uh, curious, you enjoyed your presentation. As an individual who's uh, been a transplant um, clinician and investigator for 20 years, um, I um, have witnessed, particularly in the last seven years, uh, essentially an elimination of funding for well-designed, uh, particularly large, peer-reviewed clinical trials. You know, previously uh, there was an exquisite number of program project grants. Uh, most of the agencies at NIH are not providing those anymore. Uh, there was also much more robust um, opportunities for clinical investigators through relationships with pharmaceutical companies that because of fear of conflict of interest has really uh, diminished dramatically. So where will the resources for these uh, you know, peer-reviewed clinical trials come from if they're not coming from the federal government and they're not coming from industry, the physicians, the clinical investigators really can't come up with resources to conduct these studies that you know, agencies and industry will need um, to make decisions about new therapeutics. So I, I wanted to hear your comments on this. Uh, very good question. Um, very sad reality. Uh, I will tell you, we have been uh, approached many times for grants as well. Um, we do fund some grants. The United Health Group believes in promoting research. They want to improve everybody's knowledge, we do fund some grants. Are they big? <coughs> no. I would say the biggest grant we've funded in uh, recent memory was about 100 grand, which is not that big, 
um, to get a whole lot done. Um, where's the money going to come from? Hmm. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. Um, wait till November, see if things change. That's what everybody says, right? 